Blood on your hands, Volka. Blood on your dress. Burn. Burn, Volka, and die. Die in agony for your crimes. With the upcoming release of Netflix's Witcher Season 3, a revisiting of the canonical story of the Time of Contempt, which the season supposedly adapts, seemed appropriate in preparation for a compare and contrast betwixt the true canon and whatever fanfiction that Netflix conjures. Except for this introduction, this breakdown will not go out of its way to compare and contrast the events of the show with the book. After this introduction, this video will merely focus on depicting the events that the book referenced. Once Season 3 releases, a more accurate comparison will be possible, and likely forthcoming. Chapter 1 of Messengers and Lawyers Through the eyes of a royal messenger, the tension and continent-wide fear at the coming Nilfgaardian invasion was revealed. A simple man, Applegat the Messenger, did his duty. Traversing the land and delivering heralds from kings and mighty lords, doing his small part to aid the Norse defense against a potential invasion. While briefly stopping at an inn along his hard road to Maribor, Applegat encountered a strange, ashen-haired girl, Ciri, and her stern protector, Yennefer. While saddling his horse and preparing to strike out upon the road once more, a few pieces of friendly advice from Applegat incited a fearful trance from the young girl, her eyes widening, her face blank, and her words sending shivers down the messenger's spine. Danger, danger comes silently. You will not hear it when it swoops down on gray feathers. I had a dream. The sand, the sand was hot from the sun. Applegat, shocked upon hearing the prophecy of his death, stood in near stunned silence as Siri shuddered and proceeded with her day as if nothing had occurred. Applegat was forced to continue his journey from Maribor and on to the kingdom of Edirn, his work never finished. On his journey upon a narrow forest track, the messenger briefly encountered Geralt, a witcher upon the path, who had just vanquished a foul beast of the air. A witcher must eat and contracts are his only form of payment. While Ciri is far away on the road from the Temple of Melitoli to Gors Valen to be instructed in the ways of the sorceresses by the school of Eretuza. Geralt must still pay for his daily bread, as he hunts the villainous Ryans, a shadowy mage hunting Ciri, and employed by some unknown benefactor. Geralt's hunt for Ryans led him to the quirky and conniving lawyers, Codringer and Fen, whom he hired to find Ryans and uncover his employer. However, Codringer and Fen were far more in tune to Geralt's intentions than he would have wished. They too knew a little of the girl Ciri, his connection to her, and the intentions of empires and kingdoms to find her. Together, these three men researched the Elder Blood, a term often associated with Ciri, and discussed prophecy, politics, Ciri's ancestry, and Geralt's complicated motivations to defend the young girl. Codringer wished to aid the Witcher in all his endeavors, as he believed that they were colleagues. They both helped Horsons out of difficulties. The lawyers just moved forward with the times, assisting with money and the law, while Geralt stayed in the past, an anachronistic witcher, defending against monsters on the verge of extinction. Applegat knew not how fortunate he was, a witness to history and in the presence of those chosen by destiny. This lowly messenger had seen the witcher Geralt, the sorceress Yennefer, and the child of space and time Ciri, on the eve of war and the beginning of a new era. Though he knew not how special these people were, the prophecy given to him by Ciri troubled him deeply. So, when he was resting in a tavern in Anchor on the road to Oxenford and Tredegor, and a band of assassins entered, questioning all for information leading to Ciri's capture, he risked his life, lying to protect the strange young girl who had prophesied his doom. Though his subterfuge was immediately detected, Applegat showed uncommon bravery. He bought the peculiar white-haired man he had spent a short meal with, Geralt, the messenger crossing his destined path once more, time to challenge and dispatch the assassins. Once again propelled by his duty, Applegat pressed forward from these traumatic events, continuing his journey across the land, 
getting an intimate look at the Norse preparations for a potential invasion. Hearing the first rumors of a conclave of sorcerers at Thanid called to further prepare for invasion, Applegat also unknowingly spread the lie that the Lion Cub of Sintra, Ciri, was dead. News of the Scoia'tael, or the Squirrels, a band of terrorist elves who lived in the deep woods, getting bolder and more violent also reached the messenger's ears. These elves used guerrilla warfare, stealth, camouflage, and ambushes to weaken the northern kingdoms wherever they could. Utterly oblivious to the larger implications of the events that he had witnessed in connection to Geralt, Ciri, and Yennefer, and trusting those who employed him, Applegat told all including Geralt's dispatch of the assassins to the Redanian spymaster, Dijkstra. On the road again upon a random forest track, Applegat met his destined fate. An arrow borne upon grey feathers, loosed by the hands of concealed Scoia'tael, pierced his back, forcing his dying form to be pressed hard into the scorching sand of the trail, fulfilling the darkly prophetic words of the strange girl, Ciri. Chapter 2, A New Novice Ciri and Yennefer, once they arrive in the city of Gorsvalen after weeks of travel spent training and talking, began preparation for Ciri's induction into the sorceress school of Eretuza. Disguising her easily recognizable ashen hair, Ciri and Yennefer headed to Jinkardi's bank so Yennefer could hear the local news and call in some favors with her old friend, the dwarf, Jean Cardi. Together, the dwarf and Yennefer, with Ciri closely listening, discuss Ciri's soon induction to the sorceress school, taxes, the state of the north, Nilfgaard's encroaching invasion, and King Foltes of Temeria's rapid acquisition of a fleet of commercial boats. Their only hope was that the coming conclave, to be held not far from Gorsvalen, might be able to fortify the north against all its woes. Before preparing to embark on more dire and secretive talking points, the dwarf suggested that Ciri might venture out into the city in the care of a young clerk, Fabio. Together, Fabio and Ciri explored the market square, seeing the bustle of the city and all the beautiful, and not so beautiful, sights of the city. Upon the high walls surrounding Gors Valen, these children stared out at the sea, spying on the nearby Isle of Thanid with its domineering domes of Garstain Palace and the soaring Torlara, or the Tower of the Goals, looming over it. Also within sight was the place that Yennefer had determined would be Ciri's new home, the school of Eretuza. The sight frightened the young girl. The prospect of spending her life in a place that so resembled a prison, far from those she loved, awakening deep-rooted fears within her. Returning to the market, Ciri and Fabio witnessed the merciless trial of a halfling convicted of aiding the Scoia'tael elves. A more fascinating sight soon distracted these children from the gruesome trial. A strange man called all in the market claiming that he had caught a live basilisk and brought it there to show the world that they may see this rare and dangerous creature. Ciri, fresh from her training at Kaer Morn, knew that the captured creature was not a basilisk, but was instead a wyvern. Boldly declaring her knowledge irrespective of the danger it put her in by drawing attention to herself, Ciri corrected the man. Perhaps angered by the quarrel raging beside its cage, or perhaps for another unknown reason, the wyvern broke free of its captivity, launching an assault against the bystanders. Acting purely upon instinct ingrained upon her by both Vesemir and Geralt, Ciri leapt into action, quickly dispatching the wyvern with the nearby squire's sword. Finally realizing the danger of such attention, Ciri changed the evidence to give the squire credit before using a magical amulet given to her by Yennefer to disappear and slip into the crowd. As much as Ciri wished that these events would go unnoticed, two nearby sorceresses detected the use of the amulet, accosting Ciri and berating her for sneaking away, both believing that she was a novice from the school. Once Fabio had cleared up the confusion these sorceresses, Rita and Tessaya returned Ciri to Yennefer, profusely apologizing to her, but never once apologizing to Ciri. Yennefer, now united with her sorceress sisters, accompanied them to the local bathhouse, where they met Margarita, the most beautiful and enchanting of the human sorceresses. 
said to be so beautiful that marble statues of goddesses and nymphs would have blushed at the sight of her naked form. The sorceresses, all ignoring Ciri's presence, spoke about the young girl's past and future tutelage with magic. These women also discussed the brutal tactics of the local military in rooting out Skoytel sympathizers, the violent and gruesome horrors committed against all non-humans in the military's search were so vile that they forced comparison to the acts of Falka, a radical revolutionary from the past that had shed more blood and committed more horrors than any other known. Angered by her treatment and the prospect of life at the school, Ciri fled in the night, riding to Hirundun, where Geralt and Dandelion were, according to Jinkardi. Upon her ride out in the dark, Ciri saw many things, none of which could safely be differentiated between reality or prophecy. She saw the winged helm knight of Nilfgaard, who had haunted her nightmares ever since the fall of Sintra. The wild hunt close upon her heels, and nature itself seemingly revolting against her presence. Managing to safely arrive in Hirumdun, Ciri reunited with Geralt for the first time since he left her in the care of the priestess Nenica. Their reunion was short-lived as Yennefer, furious at Ciri, also appeared, raging at all in her path. Despite her rage and her annoyance at Geralt, her softer side forced its way out. This was the first time that these two once lovers had seen each other in years, and this was the first time that the strange and ragtag family of Ciri, Geralt, and Yennefer had ever been all together. Chapter 3 Feast of the Dying The time had come for the conclave of mages and sorceresses, all scheming and plotting for their own ends under the guise of saving the North from the encroaching forces of Nilfgaard. As was the custom with these events, the night before the conclave itself, a banquet was called. Full of feigned sophistication and frivolity, such affairs were foreign and uncomfortable to the Witcher Geralt, who was more at home in the saddle upon a dusty trail. Though Ciri was safely concealed in the palace of Loxia with the other novices of Eretuza, concern for her still consumed much of the Witcher's thoughts. Distractions from Geralt's woes and concerns soon presented themselves as he found himself at the center of many powerful people's plans. These plans varied from many sorceresses' attentions to bed him there and then, to deep and shadowy plots by the Redanian spymaster Dijkstra and the sorcerer Vilgefortz. They all had plans for the Witcher, wishing to weaponize him against their enemies, many of those enemies hiding in plain sight within the banquet hall itself. To dissuade the lusting sorceresses and reveal his single-minded intentions for the evening to those with political aspirations for him, Geralt focused near solely upon Yennefer, kissing her deeply and declaring his love to her for the first time. Of all those at the banquet hall, Vilgefortz was the one who stubbornly pursued the Witcher with the most fervor. Accompanied by the sorcerer's mute assistant Lydia, Vilgefortz and Geralt walked through the Gallery of Glory, a place which remembered the bravest and most notable people from history. From Jan Becker, the first human sorcerer who safely led the first humans to the shores of the continent, to Kurgenin of Laud and Laura Durin. The legendary lovers who, unbeknownst to all present, were ancestors of Ciri and the ones who birthed the Elder Blood into humanity from an ancient elven bloodline. The sorcerer wished to someday be depicted in this gallery with the Witcher by his side, both having affected the course of destiny in the north. Together, the small group ventured out onto the battlements of the palace, staring out at the island with Loxia, Eretuza, and the Tower of the Gauls not far off. Here. The men discussed the politics of the Conclave, the history of Garstang, and the strange history of the Tower, which contained a portal to the rumored Tor Ziriel, or the Tower of the Swallows, though none had ever survived any experimentation or attempted travel to this rumored second tower. This portal also made teleportation upon the island near impossible. Despite the mage's best arguments there upon the parapets, Geralt firmly refused his many offers of comradeship and reward. Their official obligations of the evening ended, Yennefer and Geralt retired to their bedchamber, dreaming of a good life ahead of them, where all their concerns of war and death had long since 
been assuaged. Chapter 4 The Coup at Thanid The night was only just beginning, for bloodshed, terror, betrayal, and death were waiting beneath the shrouds of encroaching night. This death and horror was not merely restricted to the Isle of Thanid. For far away, the lawyers Codring Urnfen had just discovered what the Elder Blood was, an elven bloodline of immeasurable power, and how, they believed, it connected Ciri to Folka, the most violent and bloodthirsty individual from recent memory. This bloodline was connected to a prophecy of death and destruction that they believed was the Emperor of Nilfgaard's intention for hunting the young girl. They thought he wished to wed her, and birth a son. The Arch Prince of Darkness, a believed descendant and avenger of the She-Devil Falka, who had burned through the land destroying everything. This discovery was short-lived, as assassins soon came knocking, dispatching the lawyers. Back in Loxia, safe in her bed, Ciri had dreamt of the lawyers' death, awakening in fear, knowing that their bloodshed was only the first of the night. So, this young girl ventured out into the dark, searching for her family. Geralt too awoke then, soon discovering the palace in uproar. Many sorceresses, led by Philippa and aided by Dijkstra, were dragging suspected traitors out of their beds, beating and restraining them. Kira Metz and Triss Marigold were among these sorceresses taking a terrible risk to root out treachery. Amongst all the bustle, Yennefer was nowhere to be found, leading many to believe that she too was a traitor. The first casualty of the Isle came then. Lydia had been murdered by Radcliffe of Oxenford, revealing her burnt and disfigured face free of illusionary magic. With no allegiances to any, Geralt was escorted from the premises by Dijkstra and his men. Unable to allow Yennefer to be caught as a traitor nor to allow Dijkstra to take Ciri from her bed, Geralt broke free, crippling the spymaster before heading back to the palace to aid Yennefer. The attempted bloodless capture of all suspected traitors did not last long, as this was when Yennefer arrived with Ciri. All the angered sorcerers and sorceresses fell silent as they watched Ciri, who was deep in a prophetic trance, in stunned dismay. Ciri bore news that the Northern Kingdoms had made aggressive action against Nilfgaard, inciting the invasion they feared, and leading to the assassination of the King of Redania. Cities and kingdoms were falling like dominoes beneath the war machine of Nilfgaard. To Saya, enraged by Philippa's actions and worried by Ciri's prophecy, brought down the magical barriers of the palace that prevented all from using magic before freeing Vilgefortz and the other suspected traitors. Only then did the true bloodshed begin. Seemingly out of nowhere, Francesca opened the entrance to the cellars, allowing a band of Scoia'tael elves to erupt from the depths, slaughtering all they came across save Vilgefortz and his band of traitors. Ciri freed from her trance, and Yennefer struggled through the smoke of the burning palace, managing to escape death, only for the sorceress to stay behind, pushing her young ward to flee. Yennefer must stay and try to help her friends. Ciri fled out into the night, evading Ryans and his gang of assassins, but was soon cornered by a rogue sorcerer. Fighting through the slaughter with the aid of the injured Kira, Geralt found his way to Ciri, rescuing her from the treacherous mage. Fueled on by the encouragement and aid of Philippa, the Witcher and his ward escaped farther from the carnage. Once Ciri was safely away, Geralt too turned back, intent on covering the girl's retreat, leaving Ciri to run. It was not long thereafter that the winged helm Black Knight appeared and rode her down. Using all the skills she learned from the Witchers of Kaer Morhen, Ciri defended herself against the knight, defeating and unmasking him. The knight was little more than a boar himself, cowering and begging for his life to be spared. Refusing to commit murder, Ciri fled, taking shelter in the Tower of the Goals, with Geralt following from a distance dispatching as many elves as he could along the way. Before Geralt could reach the tower, he was confronted by Vilgefortz. First, the sorcerer attempted to recruit the Witcher one final time to serve Nilfgaard and fuel his own selfish goals. But when Geralt refused again, violence was the sorcerer's last resort. Never had the Witcher fought such a dangerous foe, the strength of the sorcerer baffling all reason. In a matter of moments, the sorcerer beat down the Witcher near crippling him, tearing his body apart with meticulous detail. 
For some inexplicable reason, the sorcerer spared the Witcher, allowing Triss to rescue him and safely take him from the Isle to find medical aid. As the Witcher faded from consciousness, he heard that the portal held within the Tower of the Goals no longer existed, and the tower had crumbled, allowing teleportation upon the Isle once more. As his consciousness slipped away, concern for Ciri, who was last seen in the demolished tower, consumed the Witcher's mind. Chapter 5, Tales of Doom His body beaten and broken, the crippled Witcher Geralt was safely ferried to the forest of Brachylon to be healed by the Dryads of the Wood. Sometime later, the Bard Dandelion, driven by concern for his friend, risked his life to venture into the Dryads' woods, knowing that the private and elusive women of the forest would not welcome a stranger. Singing loudly to herald his advance, Dandelion pressed forward, not knowing that the Dryad's love of music was what saved his life. Soon finding the recovering Witcher, the Bard recanted tidings of the events transpiring in the world outside the woods. The Empire was advancing, and cities and kingdoms were falling. Lyria, Vengerberg, and Edern were all defeated. Despite all the Witcher's beggings, the Bard had no news of Ciri or Yennefer. Many things were changing in the world of the continent. The free elves had retaken Doblathana, their ancestral home, by the grace of Emperor Amir in thanks for the Scoia'tael's aid. To Saya, the former matron of Eretuza and the cause of the slaughter at Thanid, could not live with her mistakes. So the old sorceress took her own life in the wake of that carnage. A plan first birthed by the lawyers Kadringer, Ven, and co-opted by Dijkstra, was put into effect. A false Ciri was surrendered to Nilfgaard, those behind the subterfuge hoping that the Emperor would not know Ciri from her imposter, but Amir would know the true Ciri anywhere. Enraged by this plot, the Emperor ordered that Cahir, the Winged Helm's Knight, and Ryans be arrested in payment for their failure to capture the young princess and their failure to prevent this trickery. Though victory was within his grasp, and his war machine was sweeping across the land. The Emperor only had one focus, to find this strange and lost girl. Chapter 6, The Girl, the Unicorn, and the Desert Awakening in a scorching desert, Ciri found herself completely alone. Casting her memory back, the young girl remembered passing through a strange portal in the Tower of the Goals, before an explosion shook her and sent her crashing into a hard surface. Then, there was nothing. Somehow, the portal in the tower had deposited her alone in the center of a vast dune-filled desert. Fighting thirst, exhaustion, heat, and cold, Ciri pressed on, refusing to give up. When her need became most dire, she resorted to the use of magic to draw strength from the desert around her, pushing her forward. Through a great effort and immense fortitude, the young sorceress survived long enough to be awoken from her tumultuous sleep by a shocking sight. A unicorn had appeared, seemingly out of thin air, and was perhaps her rescuer. The unicorn, which the young girl named Little Horse, gave Ciri strength and aid, leading her to blissfully sweet water. Her fortitude renewed, the princess and the unicorn set out through the desert getting ever closer to a mountain range. However, tragedy soon struck. A foul beast that the young witcher had never encountered in all her studies burst forth from the sand, fighting furiously for its prey. In the ensuing fight, the two worked together, blade and horn united, eventually slaying the beast. But tragically, the unicorn was gravely injured. Ciri only had one choice if she wished to heal Little Horse's injuries. Something far more powerful than her customary magic was required. She must call upon the power of fire, a dangerous source that only more advanced sorceresses than Ciri were allowed to attempt to harness. Doing what she must, Ciri reached out, capturing the energy necessary from the flame to heal her friend. Her joy at success was short-lived, as the allure of the power that fire possessed soon tempted her, 
enticing her to use it to become the greatest of sorceresses. The fire brought forth many visions before the young girl, visions of all the dead she had lost and all those she'd known soon following suit. The fire begged her to let them go, let them die. All that mattered was Ciri and the power she possessed. All others had betrayed her and tried to hold her back. The world must know her name and cower before the Elder Blood. The face and form the fire chose was of Folka, a woman who had followed such advice, allowing all she'd known and all who she'd known to burn and perish in the wake of her bloodlust and thirst for power. Frightened by the call of her power and the carnage she might cause with it, Ciri renounced it, giving up her magic, choosing to forgo her natural-born gifts of sorcery. In her moment of clarity and vulnerability, the rescuers arrived. A herd of unicorns came galloping out of the fire, carrying the young girl safely from the desert. Ciri once again awoke in confusion, this time safely out of reach of the fire or the desert. Any relief she may have felt was muted by the empty feeling that the experiences of the desert had left her with. More so, the sudden arrival of a Nilfgaardian troop dispelled any chance for reverie or contemplation. Ciri may have escaped the desert, but her journey was just beginning. Chapter 7 A New Rat Ciri, rescued from the desert but held captive by Nilfgaardian trappers, was dragged, kicking and screaming, along the roads to the capital. Stopping in a village inn along the way, Ciri was placed with another prisoner of Nilfgaard, a young outlaw named Kaylee. Kaylee belonged to a small group of Robin Hood-esque outlaws, comprised primarily of children, called the Rats. When the Rats came to rescue their friend, Ciri saw her opportunity and leapt on it, aiding Kaylee in his escape, buying entry into the Rats' ranks. Her own name and true identity a risk to reveal. Ciri took on the persona of Falka among the rats, remembering the face that the fire had chosen to represent her. Of her new outlaw allies, one stood out above the rest. Missile, a nimble rider and beautiful girl, caught Ciri's eye. Noticing Ciri's attention, Missile took advantage of it. When Kaylee came in the dark of the night to take his price of flesh from the new recruit, Missile intervened, defending the frightened girl. Missile's embrace of comfort soon demanded her own price. Ever since leaving Geralt at Thanid, this child had run from one tragedy to another, from violence and threat of death to scorching heat and violent attacks. Ciri's long journey came to a peaceful standstill, when a man nearly raped her and when a girl did. Word of Ciri's appearance in the distant Korath desert that shared Nilfgaard's southern border spread. Tawny Owl, a fearsome and violent servant of the Emperor, found his way to the town that Ciri had just escaped from, relishing the order. Tawny Owl demanded that all the rats be hanged, without exception or mercy. Here ends the tale of Time of Contempt, and here the tale of Baptism of Fire begins. There is little doubt that Netflix will choose to specifically ignore all the events transcribed here. If only Netflix would follow the simple roadmap laid out for them in Time of Contempt. The fans could be appeased, and their star actor would not have abandoned them. Alas, fan fiction is all that can be expected from The Witcher Season 3. The books are still pure, with lore and history that track in a logical fashion. At least fans will have that to fall back on as they soundly reject the abomination that has become Netflix's Witcher universe.